Thank you. Is Jen checking Hi. audio and um, video? Please let me know if I can be seen and heard. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, this is Anya. I can hear you, but I couldn't, I wasn't be able to see you. Oh. Um, Would you mind? Okay, now I can see you. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Works great. Uh, yeah, I can call you. Uh, can you hear me? Isabel, yes, we can hear okay. you. We can see you perfectly. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, this is Kusai Al Shati. Uh, just want to make sure that you're hearing me and uh, viewing me. Hi, Kusai. Yes, we can hear you and see you. Thank you. Hi, Thank Olga. Hello. Hello. Hello, hi everyone. Hello. I don't know. Yes, hello. Who is speaking? Tanara. Hi, yes, we can hear you. We cannot Thank hear you. you. We cannot see and, and you. We can, can you see me? No, I cannot see you. I don't know what's happened. Let me just check Tanara. No, I mean, it's black screen. Hi, Tanara. This is uh, Luis UNIGF Secretary. Thank you, Anya. Um, it seems it's, it's in your camera because you have the camera actually open. So it's something, maybe you are selecting another camera or something from a laptop which is closed. So the camera is sending signal, but it's black. Next, next to the camera uh, symbol at the bottom, you have um, an arrow to select the device. Okay, let, let me try. Hi, Makane, we can see you. Uh, still, we have not heard you. Flavia, I see you asking in the chat whether we can hear you. Now we can yeah. see and yeah, we yeah. can hear no, you. I was not as as a, as a speaker here. I was, uh, yeah, yeah, I just now moved it, you. Now it's fine, yeah. Works. Thank you. Anya, just a question to you about the polls. Yes. Uh, are we launching each of them at the beginning of each of the blocks? Uh, actually, let me do that test now. I think I can only, let me check. Actually, yes, I can launch. Luis, 
Can I ask you for your, your advice? You can see them, right? I can. can I? Uh, yeah, I, I think that you, you created only one. It means yeah, as a, as a one with several questions. So you will need to, to launch it yeah. at the same time. I can make them separate quickly, Flavio, if you think that's better to launch questions. I don't know. I, I leave this to you if you think yeah. it's better, because anyway, the results we would show very end. quickly at the end, yeah? Yes. At the end of the, of, the, of the session, yeah? If we have time. Exactly. So I'm thinking if we maybe to launch all four at the very beginning and just leave it open. Let me see. Can, can I do a test now, uh, Luis? Nothing will happen, right? You can, um, I don't know if people can later change their vote. Ah, correct. No, I can't guarantee that none, that uh, participants will not vote. I mean, you just need to decide if you want it separated or, or together. I mean. Well, let me see. I'm going to launch, but I'm not going to allow panelists to vote. I think there are two options here. So let me see. So what do you see? We're seeing the, the, the one for the next session, Anya. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, now. Now should be a correct one. Yeah, we are seeing two. So you see two first ones, yeah. Uh, you can go down. Oh, no, we see, see all of them. If we scroll down, yeah, we see all the four of them, yeah. So should I leave all four or you want me to make them? Because, no, because Flavio, here's the issue, right? I can, I can make them separate, but then yeah, with each block. I think block, it would be best, yeah, to separate them and launch each of them at the beginning of each block. And that means that at the end of each block, we stop with that question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me quickly do that in the background. I confirm that you can launch the poll several times and you just get the results again. So just for your information. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, what time are we supposed to start, please? Hi, Makan, this is Anya. Oh, yes, we are Anya. starting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, we can hear you. I don't think we can see you, though. But well, I had put it. Oh, you didn't put it on. We have 10 I minutes to go. On, but I put it off after. <laughs> Let me, OK. Yes, we can see you very well yes, and yes. hear you. So in 10 minutes, we start. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we haven't had the Tanara's camera for now. Can you um, hear me correctly, uh, Anya? Hi, Lucien. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. I, I, I'm just. Uh, my camera, it's a bit dark, but uh, I guess we can, you can see me. Yes, we can see. It doesn't look dark from this side, actually, it looks fine. Perfect. Works. Works great. I'm just separating these pools quickly because we decided we're going to launch pool for each block, not everything at the same time. Just, just to clarify, this is uh, the NRI main session and then we will continue in this uh, same Zoom room with the high level leaders track security. So this is what's going to happen in this Zoom room. 
Yes, I think Flavio is aware, so we need to really yeah, 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 finish the session yeah, yeah. on the hour. We have a question here from Emanuela in the question and answer pod. What is the question? Sorry, Flavio, if you uh, can help I me. Am, uh, I am Emanuela. Have I used the right link? <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, Emanuela, I'll move yeah. you now to the other side. Yeah. Actually, you are moved. Somebody moved, Emanuela. Um, seems she dropped. I don't know. I can't see her in the. Tanera, unfortunately, we can still not see your camera. It must be the device uh, because the camera is open. As a suggestion, I would say to go to the mm, button at the bottom with a camera and click on the up arrow next to it and be sure that you have selected the good camera. You can also go to video settings there and it's like that you can have a preview of the camera signal that you are sending. Yeah, you are picking up right. Hi, Mary. Yes, Flavia, please. Mary, we can hear yeah, very you. faint. Very faint, yeah. <laughs> very faint, right? Yeah, your sound is very faint, yeah. Okay, my sound is very faint. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 can much better. Me? Yeah, yeah. Is it better now? Much better Much now. Better. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, uh, because of bandwidth issues, I may not be showing my camera. So please, uh, everybody should uh, bear with me. But uh, uh, when I'm doing the introduction, I will do. I will show my camera, and after that, I will go. But yeah, it's fine. Yeah. To be here. Anya, you are kicking off, right? You In, are starting uh... the. In, in around seven, eight minutes, Mary, yes. Yes, yes, yes. But I'm saying that you, you are the first person to start. So, yes, I can I can start. Yes, you can start. I can announce you. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, are we going to observe the one minute uh, before or during the meeting? No, one minute at, silence. At the, yeah, as agreed by the scenario, we're going to do that at the very beginning. So when I when I say a few words, then minute of silence, and then you, Mary, I'll announce you, and then you announce Flavio. Flavio goes to the first discussion block. I ask our speakers, in the interest of time, to also rely on chat for introducing themselves. So I think it's very important that, in addition, Flavia will say, for instance, Zena from Lebanese IGF. But if you want, you can post in the chat more about yourself as a speaker. So that, that could be perhaps useful as a background for, for the participants. Yeah, Luis, uh, Emanuela Girardi is asking to be updated as panelist in the chat. I don't know if you can do that. Well, uh, um, yeah, we would come on. Yeah. Emanuela Girardi. Still, we don't have camera signal from Tanara, unfortunately. Um, I think in the worst case, you can speak. Thank you. Day. It's working now. <laughs> yeah, fine. So, so Anya, in place of discussion, we'll just do the poll, right? Anya? 
I'm sorry, Mary, I'm just changing the poll. I was asked to change. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, so, okay, okay, uh, Flavo, is it in place of uh, the discussion, we'll just do the poll? You mean, which discussion you mean? You know, there's block discussion, there's five minutes discussion or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll have the discussion. I, I will launch the each poll, at the, uh, Anya will launch each poll at the beginning of each block. Okay. And then we will right. the results of the four uh, polls only at, at the, the, the very end of the session. Okay, then that's fine. So we do not uh, yeah. eat time so from, we, from the discussion at the end do, of the block. Yes, but we are, so the polls go throughout the blocks. We, we still keep five to 10 minutes, depending on how speakers will keep their times for an open discussion. Okay, I think I've, uh, Flavio, let me just, since we have five more minutes to go, I'll just uh, quickly do a test with these polls because I've changed them now as you ask me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you see this one, that's the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's working fine. So that's the second one. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> okay do you hear this me? This is the third one. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we can, it's fine, the third poll, yeah. Okay, and the fourth one is this. So it works. Yeah, it works. Yeah, Great. fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we can hear you, Mr. Is it Timofey? How do you pronounce your name? Uh, my name is Timofey V. I'm from Russia, from Unknown Dialogue. I represent the Russian delegation today. Thank you. Thank you for connecting. Yes, sound and video is good. OK, I'll just, I, I think we have a couple of new speakers, so I'm going to promote them as um, panelists. Uh, Anna, uh, Anya and Luis uh, Roberto Zambrano is asking to be included. Uh, as... yes, I did. I, I just promoted Roberto. Yeah. Anya, Anya, are you going to show the the NRIs that are participating? Did you do, do the board for them? I am going to display the announcement. Okay, then that's fine. Just the announcement flyer of the session. Hello, Angie and Flavio. How are you? Hello, everyone. Hi, Roberto. Hi, Roberto. Hi, Roberto. Hi, Mary. Okay, nice to see Nick. Great to see you all. Hello. Good to see you. Hi, Hi, Dustin. We can't see you, though, Dustin, if you want to test your. Yes, we can. Works. Is Zene from um, from Lebanon going to speak? Zena, yes, Zena is here. Uh, okay, she's here. Okay, right. Um, if you, since we have two more minutes, very quickly, I'll just call by first name. So we have, I think we have everyone, but let me double check. So we have Mary and Flavia as our moderators, Lucien, Isabel, Kosai, Tanara, Jennifer. I don't think Jennifer is here. So I think Jennifer is not here. Abdias or Leah, if you are here, if you could. Uh, I, I mean, on Miss Jennifer Lopez, not on Miss Jennifer Chunk. Hi, Anya. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you yes. here? Sir? Yes, I'm here. Great. Okay. We can't. We can't uh, see your video. We just can hear you. Okay. Now, yes, works perfectly. Thank you. So we have Tanara as well. Mr. Timofey will come in the discussion block. Emanuela is here. Oswaldo. Oswaldo is not here, so I'm going to quickly text him now. So Jennifer Chang is here. Dustin is here. Olga is here. Ponselet. 
In Tanara's yes. video, we have it. Thank you, Tanara. Ponselet, so Ponselet and Osvaldo, I'm going to call them now. Roberto is here, Felix is here, Zaina is here, Mahindranath is here, Nick is here, Makan, Carlos, is Carlos here? Carlos as well. I, I've seen Mary and uh, Marcel. I think yes. they're both here. Yes. Let me search for the three missing speakers, but in any case, um, they're not among the first ones. Probably they're trying to join. Flavio, over to you and Mary to tell me when do we start? Do you want to start now or? Yeah, we are ready. I think we should mm -hmm. start that. We are at the top, top, top of the other, yeah. So officially and for the record, good afternoon from Geneva, good morning and uh, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I want to thank you for joining the NRI's main session. This has been a tradition at every annual IGF meeting since 2016, the annual meeting in Mexico. My name is, for the record only, my name is Anya Gengo. I work for the IGF Secretariat, uh, mainly with the colleagues that are running the national, regional, sub-regional and youth IGFs. This is the main session of the NRIs that's been organized completely by the NRIs in a bottom-up open collaborative manner. It is focused on discussing the role of the internet in emergency situations. Before I give the floor to our dear co-moderators, uh, Ms. Mary Oduma, uh, coordinator of the West African IGF, Mr. Flavio Wagner, affiliated with the Brazilian IGF, uh, we will start this session um, with a very uh, sad, unexpected, shocking note, I have to say. It happened during this annual IGF meeting, which makes this meeting different, makes this NRI's main session different, sad, but at the same time, we are motivated by the great legacy that has left behind our dear colleague and friend, Ms. Marilyn Cade. Many of you know Marilyn. I think she does not need any, any uh, introduction. Marilyn was endorsed to actually co-moderate with Flavio this session. Uh, and unfortunately, we were informed during the uh, IGF meeting that Marilyn has passed away. It's a great loss for not just for the NRI's community to which she gave such a strong support throughout the collaborative uh, work of throughout the years of the NRI's, but also to the entire internet governance ecosystem. She is deeply missed, but she will never be forgotten. In honor of the legacy of Ms. Marilyn Cade, in honor of her life, I ask all of you for a minute of silence. Thank you. Thank you very much. With this, um, I would like to uh, give the floor back to our dear co-moderators. Ms. Mario Duma will open this session. Mr. Flavio Wagner will follow with uh, introducing the topic, our distinguished panel today, and the goals we want to achieve in the next less than 90 minutes. Mary, please, you have the floor. Mary, I don't think we can hear you. If Mary has issues, she did inform at the beginning, then I'm gonna ask Flavio to- Can you, can you hear yes. me? Yes, can you can hear me? Hear. We can hear you now. Can yes. you hear me? We okay. can hear you. All right, okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone, wherever you are joining from. Uh, this is Mary Uduma from um, West Africa IGF. Uh, I am the coordinator and um, as we have heard from Anya, uh, this is the NRI, the main session we normally um, uh, hold uh, during the IGF, every IGF we have this uh, NRI main session. And uh, for this year, um, I, I have myself as co-moderator. Um, as she said, it would have been Marilyn Kate, but in her honor, I'm here standing in. 
and um, um, the moderator is uh, Flavio from Brazil. And um, uh, there are other, other speakers uh, from all over uh, the uh, uh, NRIs uh, from, uh, Anya will be showing them and they will be ma making some interventions as the topic we have today is the role of internet. In, a, in emergency situation, the role of the internet in emergency situation. We welcome you all to this main session. This session is organized by the NRIs in an open, bottom-up, consultative manner across all 131 NRIs. It will focus on concrete practices in which digital technologies can help people in emergency situation such as the COVID-19 pandemic. We will hear from NRIs covering, coming from different parts of the world, reflecting good regional balance, as well as diversity in views on the session's topic. Um, we know that um, uh, the speakers uh, will speak for only three minutes, please, as, uh, we have four blocks of this program, and the first one will will last, you know, it will start from now and end around 16:55, and then uh, Flavio will take take up that. My colleague Flavio from um, um, from Brazil I, IGF, he will do a better introduction of himself. And um, when you speak, please speak slowly so that um, not only that others will hear about that the interpreters will would uh, uh, be able to interpret and the captioner. Again, uh, you can raise your hands. You can also type in your question in the question Q, Q and A, a uh, page, or you can chat. Please, um, every, every voice is important. And if you sh uh, as you share, would we'll also learn and take back to our, our countries. There will be you cure, I mean, polling, and when the polling comes up, please make sure you participate. And um, I think that's what I need to say now. And I hand over to my my colleague, um, uh, Mr. Flavo Wenga, to continue with the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary and Anya. It's an honor to be here, uh, co moderating with you the session. And uh, we, of course, miss very much. Uh, our, our dear friend, uh, Marilyn Kate, she should be with us uh, in the session. She was a champion of the NRIs. And so this session is uh, in her honor also. So uh, let's move then uh, to the, the first block. And uh, we have a poll uh, for you. We will have a, a poll at the beginning of each of the four blocks of this uh, main session. And uh, the polls will remain there until the end so that you can uh, respond to them uh, when you wish, but please uh, engage uh, with us and, and respond to the polls. So this uh, first session is the first block is on uh, the Internet for World's resilience. So emergency situations uh, such as the COVID-19 uh, show that the internet plays a central role amidst uh, tough restrictions, such as in remote work and study, personal communication, service delivery, and so on. In situations like this, did the internet make your communities more resilient and how? So this is the first question we have uh, to our speakers and we will have here as uh, discussants of this first question, uh, Mr. Lucien Castex from the France IGF, uh, Ms. Isabel Cristina de Avila Benitez from the Colombia IGF and uh, Mr. Kusai al Shati from the Arab IGF. So, uh, Anya, if you can have the, the first poll on the screen, please. And then uh, let's start with uh, Monsieur, uh, Lucien Castex. So Lucien, please, the, the floor is yours. Uh, three minutes, please. Thanks, uh, Flavio. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I'm Lucien Castex. I'm co-chair of the French Internet Governance Forum, and I'm representative for public policy of AFNIC and a member of the MAG. As we are in a plenary session of the global IGF, I will switch to French. 
Internet et les technologies numériques ont joué un rôle central en cette période de crise sanitaire. Nous avons pu communiquer, continuer à échanger. We have started to play a very important role and we continue to act in such a way so that we could learn and study. The situation in France is obviously very tense and it's also very urgent. We have to take up a very serious and tough sanitary measures and it started in March this year. As you know, we have a new quarantine which is introduced all over the country. Digital technologies as well as uh, data play a very important role today in terms of the fight against the pandemic. Everything has to take place uh, with respect for fundamental human rights and with the preservation of our fundamental values. What we discussed is certainly a question of following our contacts, contact tracking as also uh, as well as checking whether or not it tampers uh, with the fundamental personal freedoms uh, uh, and uh, liberties. And, uh, the, well, Sartre, the, the French philosopher, he uh, spoke quite much about such an approach to a human being. And this is also something which is in the center of our attention. We try to act in such a way so that we could shape uh, the society in which internet plays a crucial role. With the occurrence of COVID-19, the question of internet as a space which should also be a manner, a tool to solve different problems came up. The French IFG, uh, uh, well, the, the French NRI has a very important uh, uh, role and it is made up of a number of members. Uh, and now uh, we have really very many problems which uh, are introduced in France, for example, uh, well, how, how we teach students at university, uh, how ed educational programs are being conducted and how different technologies and programs are conducted and they serve the purpose of a number of different uh, communities. As far as the French NRI is concerned, uh, we really uh, realized that we are going to divide it into different segments. And during the session in October, we started to think about the polarization of internet uh, and uh, uh, the uh, workshops were organized uh, about the responsibility online. Such workshops are also going to be organized in the future. The idea behind this is to think very deeply about this particular subject. There are three issues which came up in connection with these discussions. The first thing is connected with uh, digital sensitivity and it's connected with a sanitary emergency. It is connected with the new form in which different electronic devices are used. New services um, come up, there's a totally new manner of communication, which is widespread uh, amongst us. And all of these is very much connected with various environmental challenges. And finally, we also cannot forget about the different questions connected with the whole territory around us. And internet is in the very center of different activities that we are involved in. IGF. So please, uh, Isabel, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Hello to my fellow panelists and everyone who are joining us in discussion. I am a managing director of Ministry Information Communication Technology of Colombia. Uh, thank you to the Internet Governance Forum for this invitation. It's absolutely true when we say the affirmation that the Internet is an enabler for the common economy uh, reactivity in, diver, in different countries around the world. In Colombia, the 96% of the companies are medium, small, and micro small. And before pandemic, just the 12% of the company had had a digital process for the productivities of the business. However, the Colombia government has been constructed a public policies and facilitate the different te technological tools that allow our companies to be more competitive and they could consolidate alto pandemic. An important example about the public policies are the legal instruments of the digital transformation and the cybersecurity. The companies uh, without 
taking into account the, si the size of the organization, they begin the digitalization of the process and the strategies for increase the sales, the customer and the financial resource. In the other hand, about technological tools uh, from the Minister of Information, Communication um, and Technology uh, of Colombia, we are giving to the companies uh, that don't have a web page and any presence in the internet, a special kit of dominant.co, uh, one dominant.co totally free, a hosting of uh, the one gigabyte, three corporates uh, email accounts and a web page for increase uh, the benefits of their business. In Colombia, we understood that the internet is the most important tools and strategy for overcome the crisis, uh, the crisis generated by the COVID-99. In Colombia, we are working in this moment the, to increase uh, the connectivity in all uh, our territory. Right now, uh, just 50% uh, of the families in Colombia are connected. At, we want to connect 20% more in 2022. Actually, it is uh, the principal issue, issues about the digital policies in Colombia. Uh, all our strategies are around, are around achieve uh, that the people in Colombia call use the internet for education, for business, work, among other thing, important things for the society in Colombia or citizen in Colombia. The very important things uh, for the government is to get better lives for Colombian citizens uh, through the promotion of the access uh, to the internet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your contribution, Isabel. So uh, let's move to our third speaker. Uh, uh, in this uh, first question, which is uh, Mr. Kusai Al Shati from the Arab IGF. So, Kusai, floor is yours, please. Thank you, Flavio. And uh, let me start my uh, intervention with the remem remembering uh, my dear colleague, the late Marlene Kate, wishing uh, uh, wish her soul to rest in peace. And I am honored today to join the NRI session with this wonderful audience and panelists to talk about a, such an important issue, which is the role inter, of the internet in emergency situations. Um, there is no doubt that the internet proved to be the most critical, important tool for us within the, the unprecedented pandemic that we experienced since the beginning of this year where we were confined to our geographical location and were unable due to uh, health issues to move around, whether for business or leisure or uh, uh, meeting uh, family uh, and colleagues. Um, there is no doubt that the internet helped to ease this limitation and to overcome it, whether in uh, uh, having uh, our uh, essential uh, needs, uh, whether it is in logistics, whether in socially interacting with our colleagues, friends, and family members, or running uh, our uh, businesses. Um, although we have direct broadcasting like TVs and radios, we were mainly seeking our information uh, from the uh, internet and was the internet was the main channel for us of communicating and outreaching and to receive information whether about the pandemic or the situation of let's say the curfews or uh, the situation of, of our businesses uh, or hearing the news about it whether uh, uh, the news about the situation of COVID nationally or regionally or uh, globally so the internet proved to be the, the main tool for that. And in such case, uh, like in Kuwait, uh, and because of the importance of this tool to, our, to for, it, for government to send its information, to diffuse its information and instruction to the public, or for other businesses and for the communities, 
the government, for example, subsidized the access to the internet during the months of March and April, whether mobile or fixed lines, uh, for the capacity of five gigabytes. That's including the 5G uh, access. This is to give all the access and the possibility of access for everyone in order to receive information, whether it's from government, health services, uh, or uh, 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 try to, to, to acquire their necessities and, and uh, to run their businesses. Many trends, a new trends has been set. Uh, we are working remotely right now and we get used to work remotely and running our businesses remotely and uh, let's say buy and sell remotely, uh, acquire our main uh, or basic needs uh, remotely, uh, communicating with the friends and family members, whether they are close or far remotely. Some of these uh, trends will not be only during the COVID-19 pandemic. This, some of these trends will be set as permanent trends because we get used to it and we have noticed how practical it is. Uh, for example, let's, uh, online yeah. meetings. Kusa, or, or, excuse me, yeah. could, could you please conclude as uh, we are running out of time, please? Okay. Uh, some of these trends will remain as main trends, will, will go beyond the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, it will be as permanent, right? for example, collaboration online, meeting online, and uh, meeting with business partners, or even the logistic services. This is will be uh, permanent uh, trends uh, during, uh, which will pass the pandemic of COVID-19. So the internet has proved to be a crucial tool to us. And, and the most important out uh, uh, out beating by far other means of uh, communication like direct broadcasting TVs and radios and I'll stop here and thank you thank you very much Chris Kosai so uh, the COVID-19 uh, for example is an emergency that has also exacerbated a number of digital policy issues so our next question uh, to our uh, speakers is which issues were particularly relevant in your communities in this regard? And we have first uh, uh, Ms. Tanara Lauschner from the Brazil IGF. So Tanara, please. Thank you, Flavio. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Tanara Lauschner, and I am the current coordinator for the Mood Stakeholder Organizing Committee of the Brazilian IGF which is held annually since 2011. The year 2020 has been a challenging for the internet in Brazil and for the country as a whole. Since the beginning of March, with the rise of coronavirus cases in Brazil, people began being quarantined and social distancing become common language. Thus, with more people at home, internet infrastructure began being pushed more than usual forcing a rise in traffic peaks on a daily. As several other countries have done, Brazil has also acted and applied measures to mitigate the fallacy inherent to the period of severe conditions posed by the coronavirus outbreak, seeking to ease the traffic pressure and leverage the resilience of its network in a time of great demand of, for traffic. Government authorities convened several different stakeholders, including big telecommunication providers and task forces to design and apply measures to face the new challenges posed to the national infrastructure. On a positive note, Brazilian connectivity infrastructure also relies upon a broad ecosystem of internet exchange points spread all over the country. Designed to handle heavy broadband traffic, uh, heavy broadband traffic. While the internet in Brazil faced a traffic increase, the internet exchange points operated by the Brazilian Network Information Center, NIC.PR, have been dealing well with peaks over 11 terabits per second. 
Brazil also powered up discussions on fake news and disinformation. The pandemic made clear that the internet plays as a central role in situations of tough restrictions. People need to be well connected to have access to update information, mitigation measures, public authorities guidance and so on. This access also shows the complex issue of dealing with disinformation in a time when citizens need to be oriented to help society overcome challenges. In this sense, several well-known individuals have been raising lots of concerns about the disinformation crisis in the country. The Brazilian Congress is now debating a draft bill that tries to mitigate the spread of fake news and disinformation. Nevertheless, expert, experts and stakeholders have been raising concerns about the risks that this proposal may pose, especially with regards to freedom of expression, communication, privacy, and data protection, as well as innovation and business models. Finally, on behalf of the Brazilian NRI, I would like to share our condolences for the passing of the Mrs. Marilyn Cage. Her legacy will not be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanara. So let's move to Ms. Jennifer Lopez from the Panama IGF. So Jennifer, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Flavio. As my colleague said before, COVID-19 pandemic has remarks on the importance of open and transparent governance, access to information, and ethical digital standards related to privacy. And data are vital aspects to consider before, during, and after an emergency. Panama has made significant progress in digitalization, and this is in the face of identifying several challenges and opportunities in things such as infrastructure, internet penetration, specialized human resources, public policies, regulatory framework update to help close the existing digital divide. As a result of the impact coronavirus has on the lifestyle we had, we must work from home due to quarantine. However, not the entire population has the computer equipment or internet service required to do so. Just on February 18, Law 126 began to apply, establishing and regulating teleworking in the Republic of Panama and amends an article of the Labor Code. It is a great achievement from the crazy product of the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, we hope to update our labor code with the use of information and communication, technologies, and international trends in the new digital age. The state of emergency caused by the pandemic alarmed us on data processing resulting in a deployment of measures to protect citizens' privacy and prevent attacks on their cybersecurity. The development of application focus on the, on the evolution of the pandemic and security in both the, the public and private sector was high as efforts were mostly directed to or directed at the financial sector and telework, where the threat to cybersecurity increased with interactions. An electronic administrative site, panamadigital.gov.pa, was established as the sole portal of the citizen, which will allow the integration of all channels, media, and plan platforms established by public entities for the execution of online procedures, in addition to their consultation and follow-up by us users. Law 144 of April 15 considers the rules for the protection of personal data and limits public servants' access to sensitive user information. The government created agencies such as the National Direction of Government Innovation Projects and the direction of innovation and technological transformation as facilitating entities in the digital government modernization project are responsible for the formulation and implementation of innovation projects. It also provided that public entities should include within their annual budget the funds needed for the fulfillment of their digital agenda. To solve the economic problems of citizenship, the government created the Panama Solidario Plan which provides a voucher for the purchase of food and medicines. It works by using the ID card in all markets and drugstores around the country. To verify the available credit is needed to enter a governmental portal where personal information of the beneficiary is used, such as the ID and full name. In this sense, I can mention that even though it is private data, data in order to access it, 
it is required for the person to place the ID number and to confirm their identity by means of other control data that only the person knows. Focusing on a freer, more accessible internet with less, less vigilance and greater privacy is essential because information, for example, is a digital right for everyone. COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically enhanced the role of digital communication technologies in everyday life. Although resolving complications across cybersecurity and privacy will require new norms and policies, the challenges are a lot and so the chances too. Considering the short-term and long-term challenges faced by the government, the active progress of digital technology and the changes in related applications, such as digital government and social impacts, Panama can be expected to pay increasing attention to relevant policy measures. Also, influences from yes, yeah, this could okay. this I will conclude. Soon. Also, influences from the COVID-19 pandemic and other emergency situations will in only encourage the, to take advantage of the power of digital innovation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. So uh, we have uh, uh, already signed up for intervention in this block, Mr. Timofey uh, from the Russian Federation. So uh, the floor is yours, but please uh, be very quick as uh, we are already over the time of this uh, sure. block. Sure, yeah, please. sure. First, I'd like to thank organizer for the opportunity to enlighten our experience and ideas across the subject. Well, nobody would doubt that once in crisis, society claims higher demand for reliable information, but there is a pitfall. Reliable information is not enough as long as it is not packed in some empathic, vivid, and understandable form. Moreover, we have to actually hunt for people's attention. As a matter of fact, being online, they have plenty of other stuff to look at. To ensure that a special information coordination center has been set up in Russia to manage all the public communications, various state ministries and authorities around the subject of coronavirus. While doing that, more than even before, we faced all the challenges modern technologies could actually raise. On the one hand, internet, social networks, and last but not least, instant messengers have become a main entity for spreading fakes and misleading information. Some of them could be funny labeled hawks about helicopters, I guess you had that, flying around cities and spraying disinfectants. But also there were fakes that carried direct threat to people's health and lives such stories regarding incorrect methods of prevention and treatment of coronavirus disease could lead to denial for fundamental medical care and the result end in real human death. Frankly speaking, the pandemic of fakes did not miss our country. The level of anxiety and the risk of social disunity in society was quite high. People were rumoring different stories from jokes around vodka, treating coronavirus, to some mystical conspiracy engaging global state and Bill Gates trying to achieve the whole world. To fight that, We've transformed all the official communication into different forms of media, which regular internet users are used to actually consume among their normal internet behavior. These forms were at greatly from official state accounts and page on social media platforms to integration and collaboration with popular bloggers and influencers. The big win was when we launched more than 60 official regional telegram channels, each corresponding to a state regional anti-coronavirus headquarters. They called 12 with both distributing official and reliable information and debunking fakes. For example, once we found a fake about some criminals pretending to be epidemiological service who allegedly were infiltrating and robbing homes under that cover, within 30 minutes, we got a response from the police that there was absolutely no basis for that story to be true. Police released an official statement and within a few hours, we have distributed an exposure of that fake across all 85 regions of Russia. In partnership with large social networks, we established a shortcut mechanism of removing fake content in minutes after detection. Well, to sum up, internet has brought us a serious challenge for social integrity and health, but simultaneously it gave us a direct way to establish trustful communication in between authorities and people where we as a state could provide openness, empathy, and ability to speak the same language. As a result, we have raised a lot of experience and we are ready to share it without any limitations. We are planning actually to hold the International Anti-Crisis Conference on September 2021. So I would like to invite all of you if the epidemic situation will be satisfactory, meet in person in Russia and discuss actual practices and approaches to struggle information crisis. Uh, now I'd like to all drop a message in our chat if you think that such an event could be useful or not. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Timofey. So uh, we're on the, uh, we are all over the time of this first block. Uh, we don't have uh, specific questions in the chat. So 
we will uh, try to move uh, to the second block of this uh, main session, which is uh, which will deal with technologies helping people. Uh, I would ask uh, Anya to launch the, the second poll for this session. We will try to look at examples of good practices for combating emergency situations using database technologies and emerging technologies. And we have uh, three speakers. Uh, first from Italy IGF, Ms. Manuela Girardi, from the Dominican Republic IGF, Mr. Osvaldo Loren Quint, and from the Asia Pacific IGF, IGF Ms. Jennifer Chang. So let's start uh, with uh, uh, Ms. Emanuela Girardi from the Italy IGF, and please, all the speakers, uh, no more than three minutes as we uh, need to stick to our time. So I will try. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm a part of the IGF Italy, of the program committee of IGF Italy. And today I would like to bring the Italian experience in using data and AI technologies to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. So in March 2020, the pandemic hit Italy, and Italy had been the first European country to face the emergency and was not at all prepared. But the Italian community of AI researchers and scientists joined together and developed several concrete proposals to help government, health institutions, and doctors to face the health emergency. So today I will um, quickly mention three initiatives very relevant. The first one on bioinformatics, the second on image analysis, and the third that has already been mentioned by the Russian colleague and also by the Brazilian colleague about our infodemic. So bioinformatics. A group of scientists used AI algorithms to analyze the protein and the molecular data and to provide inputs for drug repurposing activities. So the analysis and the data set that provided by this group had been very useful for the scientists who were looking for existing drugs, drugs that didn't need for further authorization and that could be used immediately and directly to treat COVID-19 patients. Second, image analysis. So another group of scientists worked together with radiologists and doctors to collect CT scans and X-rays of patients with lung infection, both with COVID and not COVID infection. So they analyzed the data with AI image recognition algorithms, and they could provide a tool for making diagnosis, uh, diagnosis faster, cheaper, and more manageable in the hospital process. The third one, infodemic, that has already been mentioned by the interview before me. And basically, like they said, um, during the crisis, we have all been exposed to a huge amount of COVID-19 information or misinformation, fake news. And as, as he said, not all of these were reliable information, and it was making it very hard for people to, to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they needed it. So another group of scientists in Italy, they used an AI model to analyze the social media data and to identify and monitor this overload of unreliable information. And they built an infodemic index. So this index is, has been a very useful early warning signals for the Italian governments to evaluate the impact of the policy that they were developing and to monitor the emotions and the sentiments of the citizens. Consider that at the beginning of the, of the pandemic in Italy, this index was at a level of 30 out of 100. And after three weeks of the lockdown, uh, the, um, the official communication started and the policy started and the index went down to three. So it reduced dramatically the disinformation and fake news. Okay, so since there are, uh, I mean, we developed several initiatives, but I'm also very interested in hearing and learning from the experiences of the other countries. So I thank you, Flavio, and I give you back the, the floor. Thank you very much, Emanuela, for the very relevant contribution to the question here. So now let's move to Mr. Osvaldo Larenquent from the Dominican Republic and IGF. So please, Osvaldo. Floor is yours. Three minutes, please. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. First of all, please let me congratulate the previous participants related to this subject of role of the internet in emergency situation. Looking at the samples of good practices for combating 
emergency situations using database technology and emerging technology. A group of researchers from our country in Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, and Argentina formed an interdisciplinary team to uh, learn about some conditions experienced by elderly after social distancing due to COVID-19 imposed since March 19 in our country and in, in different parts of the world. The objective was uh, to find out from the pandemic, if the old people maintain an active life, uh, what is the level of use of ICT to establish relationship, learning activities, recreation, and emotional state? The result of the research showed that the elderly of these samples remain active during household course, and they use ICT to communicate with family and friends to learn uh, new knowledge and recreation. Uh, we also uh, check out uh, the, in a scenario where no access to technology uh, prevail in this group of age. And so that there was different emotions uh, related to the use of technology and the not use of technology. Uh, considering uh, the bonding relationship and new learning at this time as essential. Uh, we, we noticed that all people and the need to create in technology training spaces that reinforce intergenerational, uh, interpersonal relationship and public policy can make a sense in order to improve the, this, this group of people in uh, adopting technology. In another uh, area, the Dominican government, uh, government have been working on different uh, digital agenda uh, focus. And they have been practicing by providing public services via web in order to improve the uh, possibility to access different services, certificates, uh, tax paying, and things like that, that creates an opportunity for everybody to reduce timing and to in this moment of a digital uh, 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 the COVID emergency to have access to these different opportunities. This has uh, proved to be very effective in these moments. And another area where the government has been uh, applying a database uh, applications is for tracking or informing people using COVID apps uh, based on Android or iOS platforms to provide services with the mobile, uh, using chatbots to allow people to auto-diagnose and determine if they are infected or not. This has been that this has been a, a proven a being effective effective since the epidemic authorities can track them based on privacy and data protection policies and eh, complying with these different approaches. And as we know, eh, could in Dominican Republic, Oswaldo, could you please conclude? Yes, yeah. yes, this is my final remark that yeah. as we know, uh, remote working, educational in initiatives and different apps to, to promote those services have been effective in our country situation in these emergency times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oswaldo, for your contribution. So uh, now we have uh, Miss Jennifer Chang from the Asia Pacific IGF. So please, Jennifer, floor is yours. Thank you, Flavio. Hello, colleagues. My name is Jennifer Chung. I'm speaking with behalf of the Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Regional IGF on right now. Um, really wanted to, to applaud colleagues who've spoken before me about really effective uh, solutions that, that very innovative and effective solutions that many states and countries uh, have found during this uh, pandemic times. As we all know, Asia Pacific is a home of a really large, diverse region of different economies developed, developing economies in transition. And the COVID-19 pandemic itself has originated from, from this region and lots of different ways of combating uh, and, and mitigating the impacts felt uh, were seen across the region. In fact, three, um, three states have been lauded as very successful in combating such, uh, such crises, such as um, New Zealand, uh, South Korea, and uh, Taiwan. And also, um, 
Vietnam. And it's really interesting because this turns um, the assumption on its head that it's only, you know, countries that are very rich in resources are own, uh, successful in combating such uh, crises. In fact, many developing economies in, in the Asia Pacific have also innovated very much during this period. Um, in Taiwan, uh, as an example, as, as a, an economy that was very successful in, in, in mitigating these risks, many um, people cited, you know, trust in the government and also the very effective rollout of different measures, such as contact tracing that doesn't require real name information, uh, contact tracing that doesn't that uses throwaway emails and, and prepaid mobile numbers, because a lot of people did have concerns of privacy when we're looking at contact tracing apps. Another example that we were discussing during uh, APRGF was um, the, the problems that are faced by uh, communities that are underserved, people with disabilities. In, in normal situations, in non-emergency situations, many of the information that reaches this community is already very difficult. And when you see the added pressure of COVID-19, this actually makes it worse. So we had the case study of, of Bangladesh uh, government being very quick to respond to creating a, a separate channel with real text and also sign language videos to actually uh, push real information out to uh, communities that are vulnerable to this situation. And um, also in the context of time, I would like to really wrap up on the on the final um, a point that is very important that was brought up during our discussions this year, which is learning during uh, COVID-19. I think previous uh, colleagues have already mentioned because everything has been digitalized, the, the access gap uh, a digital divide has been even more exacerbated by all these conditions and adapting to, to actually using different infrastructure in the case study of, of um, Philippines where we had students who actually had to climb trees to get to better Wi-Fi signals really highlights the importance of having a very holistic uh, uh, system of looking at access, of looking at changing um, how we look at education for, for the students that are, are most vulnerable and, and, and least able to, to continue with, with, with their education life. And I do notice that in, in our- uh, Would you please conclude that we- Of course, we, yes. Three minutes, yeah, including please. Right now, um, I do see in the agenda, we do have a South Korean IGF colleague, so hopefully we'll hear more about the success stories there. Back to you, Flavio. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. So. Uh, so, in discussing examples of good practices uh, using uh, technologies uh, for combating emergency situations, let us now focus on vulnerable groups. And we have two speakers here. Uh, first one is Mr. Dustin Loop from the IGF USA, and then Ms. Olga Cavalli from the Argentina IGF. So, Dustin, please, uh, floor is yours. Uh, three minutes at most, please. Thank you, Fabio. Um, so on, on behalf of the IGF USA, I first wanted to thank everyone in the community for the outpouring of support for Marilyn. It's been a massive loss and she'll be greatly missed, but it's great to see her live on through, through all of you and your work. Um, but like many of the other NRIs, COVID-19 has dominated the discussion at, at the IGF USA 2020. Um, four of our nine sessions referenced it in the title and instead of giving a keynote to a single person, we compiled a video of people from across the US in different fields sharing their experiences, focusing on issues like connectivity, education, and ultimately the role that the internet played in everyday life in a way that it had not before. For example, there was a large healthcare provider that went from 1,600 virtual encounters in the entire month of February to over 60,000 per week in April. The Department of Corrections in Pennsylvania quickly expanded virtual visitation for inmates and their loved ones to safely visit workplaces went remote and so did schools. The results were certainly a mixed bag, but a few themes emerged. First, both the providers and the recipients of these virtual services needed to have access to the internet devices and know-how in order to utilize them. The best practice here is having infrastructure and technology and knowledge in place prior to the spike in demand, although this of course does not always happen. Second, governments and other large decision-making institutions needed to understand the importance of the solution and respond accordingly. This could mean doing more or less. Telehealth provides a case for demonstrating this. Uh, healthcare providers rapidly scaled their virtual offerings and in some cases practices went 
100% virtual, continuing to provide much needed care to their patients. So what did it take for this to happen and where did it fall short? One thing that we found is that the technology and functionality already existed, but there were economic, institutional and regulatory barriers hindering this rollout. In response, we saw the national and local governments take steps to quickly make the necessary policy changes, some temporary, to pave the way for healthcare providers. With technology already in place and governmental decisions to relax privacy regulation, allow cross-jurisdictional medical care, and shift policies around insurance coverage for remote visits, providers were able to deploy solutions rapidly. However, as mentioned, virtual solutions require things to be in place on the recipient's end as well. And here's where we saw gaps as the digital divide exposed itself to the entire nation. We cannot provide virtual solutions during emergencies if the infrastructure in the broad sense of the word is not in place. Thankfully, there was a widespread movement by companies, including ISPs, as well as local, public, and private institutions that moved quickly to meet the connectivity needs and get people online to access the services they needed. What has become readily evident is that we need to develop sustainable solutions that are ready for the next emergency instead of rolling out temporary solutions each time and the services so that the services can reach everyone when they are needed and they don't have to wait on the technology to reach them. Thank you very much, Dustin. Thank you, Thank you for sticking to the three minutes. So, uh, Olga, Olga Valley from the Argentina IGF. So. Oh, Flavio, obrigada. Hello, everyone from Buenos Aires, Argentina. My name is Olga Cavalli. I represent the Argentina IGF, and I will share with you some interesting things about uh, some rural activities that we had in the country. First of all, let me remind our dear Marilyn Kate. I'm sure she's with us in this moment because she was very active and she will always be with us. And congrats to the IGF Secretariat for a very successful IGF and this very good session organized by colleagues. So Argentina is a federal country with 23 uh, provinces and one uh, the federal capital with a vast uh, geography. So uh, in normal time, we had no formal borders in between these provinces, but during COVID, there is no way to move along the provinces. There were restrictions to move along the roads and crossing provinces. This may mean nothing to many of us that we can work from home, but it represented a big problem, especially for very small agricultural producers. So Argentina, is a, is a, its economy is based on agriculture mainly. So the small producers have a very, very bad time because they couldn't sell their products and that harmed very, very deeply their sustainability, their economic sustainability. Also, this, this part of the economy is very informal. They are usually not very related with banks and they pay everything in cash and face to face. So that represents to them a, a very challenging situation. Uh, usually their products are, are, are being sold in, in, in cities nearby, but that represents that they have to move from one province to the other province and they could not do that. So the National Institute for Agricultural Technology, what, what we call in Spanish the INTA, Instituto Nacional de Tecnología Agropecuaria, uh, had a, a very interesting idea. And thanks to my dear colleague, um, Matias Centeno, who works there, he, he has been telling us about this, uh, this in initiative. They developed a network called Commercial Solidarity Network. So uh, it does, um, they created a system which uh, included several online virtual shops using different social networks and other connectivity tools. So, uh, and the communications were mainly made by mobile phones and data with mobiles with these uh, small producers. So what they allowed uh, them to sell their products and they, they got also the authorization from the government to move from province to, the, uh, to other provinces. So these small producers could be uh, sustainable with, with this crisis. The interesting thing is that the uh, International Institute of uh, Agricultural Technology was working with them to promote the use of technology and the use of formal payment methods. That was before, but now this accelerated a lot with the pandemic. So that this has been, I think it's, it's a good experience of how this critical situation developed into a very good um, development using technology and uh, formal payment meth methods. If you're interested, the website of this initiative is agroemprendedores.org. 
www.ecom.ar. I will I will copy the paste the link in the in the chat. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for inviting me. Muchas gracias, Olga. So thank you, Olga, and. Uh, Flavio, you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Olga. Uh, and uh, let's move to the discussion on this second block. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Eun Chung Choi from the South Korean IGF, who has uh, signed up for intervention. So uh, please, uh, Mr. Uh, Choi, uh, you have uh, up to two, two minutes for your intervention, please. I think disease control uh, is very widely acclaimed by all uh, the uh, worldwide media. Uh, and this is it uh, successfully saved the citizens more life. The strategy can be summarized into three parts. First, all your sharing and database technology in contact tracing, contact tracing COVID-19. The most interesting feature of the South Korea strategy is that instead of enforcing some draconian rule or severe lockdown in emergency situation, South Korean government adopted some database contact tra tracing practice comprising of the ranking mobile phone GPS data and credit card transactions and public transportation record something. And most of all policymakers uh, took account of the tech balance between public health investigation and ensuring the anonymity and confidentiality of the personal data. Uh, South Korea's best practice study has a meaningful implication to us. But we should learn that it would be important in fighting coronavirus to dispel unnecessary privacy risk concerns. Uh, when government successfully satisfied this concern and dispel this concern, uh, more people will welcome this measure. Moreover, this database technology should be used in compliance with the due process law and preserving anonymity of the individual identity is very important. Admittedly, uh, some critics have raised a concern about too much disclosure of the personal data. Then immediately, South Korean government uh, changed the data disclosure guideline to patient path because uh, to dispel the, the, the concern of the privacy, they changed it twice about the guideline and narrow down the range of data closure. Uh, in the broad sense, all in all, database contact tracing technology have been widely accepted by Korean citizens without considerable backlash. It's very important. And it is because the entire purpose of data gathering is precisely focused on epidemiological investigation for the public safety, not the not other same kind of criminal investigation or something. While Korean citizens hold a strong sense of privacy, they are admitting deployment of the database technology with the estimated reason for the public safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anshang. So uh, uh, we move then uh, quickly to the third block of our uh, main session. And uh, this will uh, is entitled No One Left Behind. So uh, we have also a poll here. If Anya, could you please uh, uh, share the poll with us on the screen? And it will be left there for you, uh, attendees, to, to respond to the poll. So the first question in this uh, third block of our session is how to secure the deployment of online tools and services for combating emergency situations. And for uh, responding to this first question, we have three uh, speakers invited. Mr. Ponsalet Ileleji from the West African IGF, uh, Mr. Roberto Zambrana from the Bolivia IGF, and uh, Mr. Felix Hernandez Gil from the Spain IGF. So, uh, Ponsalet, you are first, and, and please, all the speakers, uh, three minutes each. Uh, I would have to interrupt you because uh, we are all over our time. So, please, Ponsalet, the floor is yours. I don't see Poncelet Flavio currently on a call, so maybe you can move to another speaker and I'll Yeah, speak. yeah. Okay, let's move to Roberto Zambrana from, from Bolivia. So, por favor, Roberto. Thank you very much, Flavio. 
Uh, nice to be here with all of you colleagues. Well, I would like to start saying that uh, as we all had in our countries, we most of us uh, started a lockdown around March. In our case, we started in 23rd uh, of March. And of course, most of the services were affected, particularly the ones like education, very critical ones, and also the public services for the citizens, all their paperwork, all of that, that kind of things were free set during that time because they will, wouldn't be able to continue doing those that are very important for them. Uh, of course, no one was prepared. Uh, and uh, despite the many advances that many of these uh, offices in the, the, in the public sector par particularly, despite of them, um, it takes years to, to be prepared for a for, for a crisis like this. And it takes years to prepare all the technological infrastructure that is needed to overcome this kind of situation. And I want to share a very interesting uh, experience coming from the local government in, in La Paz, Bolivia. And for from the fir very first uh, moment, actually, they continue working uh, using technology as a main ally not only working with uh, mobile applications and uh, web portal where they have published all of their services, but also uh, using um, a contact center in a very clever way. I mean, combining IP uh, telephony um, and uh, making this available for the um, these city hall workers uh, and enabling them to work from their homes. So that was very important uh, thing to, to share um, that allow all the people to concur using this kind of technology, using these channels of contacts and communications with the city hall in order not only to receive information, but to receive service act uh, services actually. Um, just a, a, a key example of, of what happened uh, uh, regarding the, the amount of people that was attended. Before the pandemic, there were registered uh, about 40 to 50,000 um, people that were using this kind of services. But after the pandemic, the, the recent me measure uh, was about 250,000 people. Well, of course, this pandemic brought very sadness for everyone in, in a global way. But if we can think about positive, positive uh, um, things that this pandemic bring to us, to everyone, was the um, speed, the boost that it provided to all this uh, technological service using internet as the main channel of communication. Thank you very much, Flavio. Muchas gracias, Roberto, and thank you for sticking to the three minutes. Very timely. So uh, now uh, we move to Mr. Felix Hernandez Gil from the uh, Spain IGF. So, uh, Felix, floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Fabio. In Spain, the availability of high-speed internet access network is being key in emergency situation, allowing the continuity of activities like remote working, online education, or the provision of public services. So it has been crucial to put in place measures to ensure the deployment of good internet access network. The regulation plays a very important role, role in this. In Spain, the regulation framework made possible the, the several telecom operators invested in fiber asset network and that produced a high availability of wideband internet assets. Now the fiber coverage in Spain is around 80% of the homes. There is also a universal service regulation that ensures a very wide coverage of more geographic areas and enough speed for the internet access. There is now the plan to establish a, a minimum speed of uh, 30 megabits per second. And a new regulation is also being introduced to ensure the availability of load 
cost offer for people with uh, limited resources. During the pandemic, it has been also very helpful the offering of free additional resources by telecom operators that are especially useful for people with few economic resources. This includes a free additional capacity for mobile network subscription and the provision of free internet access for some usage. Another key issue has been the availability of public online services that are used to help people that has been seriously affected by the pandemic. The conventional face-to-face -face services are totally saturated due to the high demand. So the online services play a key role in, in this situation. Well, and that is all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Felix. So thank you very much. So uh, another question related to this block is uh, how to tailor our policies and actions to support the most vulnerable ones. And addressing this question, we have uh, speaker Ms. Zeyna Buharb from the Lebanon IGF. So Zeyna, please, floor is yours. Three minutes. Uh, hello. hello, everyone. Well, while uh, I fully agree with all what uh, have been said uh, from my colleagues, uh, uh, but we should not underestimate also the risks that children uh, might, face, uh, might face when using uh, technology. In the current COVID situation where young people are connected online for longer time and where the internet is providing limitless opportunities for them to learn, to communicate, uh, to socialize, uh, to share their views, the same, this same internet might pose significant challenges also to their safety. So keeping them safe online has become an increasingly urgent matter. In Lebanon, uh, we urgently needed to review what has been done to protect them. A main session during uh, the virtual Lebanese IGF was dedicated to safer internet for children during crisis. It highlighted the missing required actions and invited all stakeholders to collaborate before it's too late for our society. The biggest challenge in the current situation is to rapidly create a safer environment for children on the internet. And this is not only a national Lebanese challenge, but also a global one. Knowing that harmful content can psychologically and morally affect our children, we need to accelerate our uh, mission. In fact, the Higher Council for Childhood within the Ministry of Social Affairs uh, has played a key role in uh, establishing uh, a, uh, a national committee that works to coordinate efforts between all parties concerned with this issue, uh, NGO uh, with this uh, issue. Uh, we also, uh, this, uh, this same, uh, the same uh, committee uh, now is uh, working on preparing uh, materials for teachers, and another handbook for parents uh, in order uh, to educate them how to protect their children from the dangers uh, that, might, uh, that might face uh, on the internet. She also have uh, also a role in the safety of children online and their activities are carried out either solely or in partnership with government agencies. These activities are based on interactive techniques and focus on child protection topics and life skills, such as building self-confidence and teaching them when to say no. Close cooperation is also taking place with Cybercrime Office, as Lebanon witnessed an increase in reporting cases during the lockdown. It reached uh, uh, around nine complaints per day by minors. So as a result of the closure, the public prosecution offices stopped receiving complaints. The mechanisms adopted for reporting were the web page Bellig, or in English it's a report, in addition to the social media pages and the phone number of the Cybercrime Bureau. Parents were urged to immediately report any uh, criminal attempt. 
uh, with corona, the number of complaints related to threats increased as criminals uh, used the name of health organizations to request private information with the aim of stealing as well as hacking smartphones, request an amount uh, of money in exchange, re reactivating for uh, phones. Internal security forces continue Zena, raising could you please, uh, try to wrap up, please? Yes, many lessons were learned from this, uh, from this pandemic. Most important one is that we need to coordinate efforts for spreading awareness and to work together on updating the relevant laws and policies to include strict measures that protect our society and our children when exposed to dangers on the internet. Thank you, Flavio. Thank you, Zaina. Thank you very much. Yeah, protecting the, the children is uh, really indeed a, a very important issue, uh, in, especially in such emergency situations. So, uh, in going into our uh, discussion, we have uh, Mr. Mahendranath uh, Buzgopal from the Rishus IGF signed up for intervention. So, Mahendranath, please, floor is yours. Uh, two minutes at most, please. Thank you, Professor Flavio. Hi, everybody. I am Mahendranath Buzgopal from uh, Mauritius. Uh, we have heard about how to secure the deployment of online tools and services for combating emergency situations, and also how to tailor our policies to support the most vulnerable ones. Actually, we are seeing that emerging situations and new threats have arisen, and we need to look for appropriate measures to circumvent the adverse uh, effects. As NRIs, we are looking and working with communities so that everyone has access to the emerging tools and in so doing, keeping our promise not to leave anyone behind. The goal that we want to achieve in this part of Africa is that no one is left behind. I will take this opportunity to highlight what Mauritius IGF is proposing to do. We have embarked on a research study with a main aim to encompass all communities and in short, everyone. This research study is looking at connecting the internet community bridging gaps and eliminating digital inequality. The main objectives of the study can be summarized as follows. We want to sensitize and collect information from the marginalized and difficult to reach population on the internet usage to develop evidence-based solutions to open accessible and right-based internet for all, to come up with solutions of roping everyone to the process of internet and also to acquaint participants and audiences on digital literacy and the African Union Declaration on Internet Governance. What will be the impact? In short, the recommendations will secure the deployment of tools and services, and the expected outcomes will, among other things, look at African citizens tracking progress on digital literacy penetration and African Union Declaration on Internet Governance and Africa's Agenda 2063. Participants will also be acquainted on the concept of Internet Governance and how they can be producers and not just consumers in this ecosystem. We also want to go forward for empowerment of disadvantaged and disabled children using Internet to meet their needs. And finally, the rural communities taking up and harnessing opportunities that come with internet access. In At Mauritius, we want no one to be left behind with a main target, and we expect to encompass the following communities. Out of school youth, homestay mothers, rural community leaders, disabled children, among others. And in conclusion, I would like to say, in order to secure the deployment of online tools and services for combating any situation linked with the internet, people need to be educated and have the ability to have their personal say while accessing the internet. As NRIs, we need to allow individuals to decide what is actually happening at internet level and empower them to have their personal choice. Education is a starting point and we can do it now. Pulling citizens all together with educational tools is a public action oriented pledge from Mauritius IGF. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahindranath. So, 
let's move now to the fourth block of this uh, main session and let's talk about economies in emergency situations. So one of the main issues caused by this pandemic is the negative economic eff effects for families and individuals in our communities, considering long lockdowns that make it impossible to continue working or doing regular activities, particularly for those self-employed. So you yeah. see on the screen a poll uh, regarding uh, this economic question uh, with regard to the emergency situation we are facing. Uh, so the question here is, uh, what are good, good policy practices from stakeholders around the world taking advantage of internet services uh, to support economies in those times? And we have uh, four speakers uh, for this uh, fourth block. Let's start uh, with uh, Mr. Nick Wenban smith from the United Kingdom IGF. So please, Nick, three minutes, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's Nick Wenban smith here. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the United Kingdom Internet Governance Forum as uh, part of the Secretariat, which um, I support. Um, the committee uh, held a full program this year. Um, we mirrored the United Nations global IGF themes, but we did it everything through the COVID um, lens of the time because this was held over a three-day period, the 15th to the 17th of September. So pretty current, and we did that specifically with the timing of this meeting in, in mind. We focused on um, the same uh, core themes, trust, particularly protecting digital rights during the pandemic, inclusion, and with a particular focus on the skills gaps and access, which has been exacerbated by the uh, pandemic, um, data and algorithmic transparency, which is obviously increasingly important, um, and, and last but not least, the internet and the environment. Um, so, I mean, the first thing to point out would be that Overnight with the pandemic, it resulted in a remote working um, arrangement. Um, yeah, I'm currently speaking to you from the second national lockdown. So pretty much we uh, went through uh, maybe several years of economic uh, digitization in the, in the space of a few weeks. Um, coming now to support the good policy practices, which um, have been essential for our economy, um, I think we all knew how important digital was to our national economy and also to the global economy, but this is only emphasized just how important it has been to be able to have a, a strong, resilient digital economy. Our internet infrastructure came under significant pressure and scrutiny, but pr proved highly resilient and absolutely crucial for our economic survival. So all of the investment that had been made in it paid good dividends when it came to the overnight um, digitization and remote working that we had to go through. And I suppose my main point is that the acceleration of these existing trends resulting in some, some step changes, and I specifically wanted to call out a couple of um, important points of policy which have helped us through this and will continue to guide us as we uh, go through this process. I mean, firstly, our government um, launched in partnership with business uh, a digital national strategy um, around well, what what, is, what are we doing as a nation and how are we strategically approaching the, the, the digital um, world? And already we're thinking about post-pandemic and the, 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 the phrase we use is to build back better, to build back into something which is more susceptible to a low carbon environment for smarter working and will be more sustainable for, the, for our future and for our future generations. Um, but with everything, there's a very pro-business and pro-innovation focus. So it's a very ambitious national data strategy also, also launched in order to how do we maximize the use of our national data, not just for health, but for, for all business purposes. It's very pro-innovation and um, heavily relies on industry partnerships with not just the digital tech companies, but with the small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, we have also a very strong focus on the risks of an increasing digitized um, uh, business environment and the fact that online harms um, do need to be addressed and that has become a higher priority and the government is bringing out national legislation um, in the, the last quarter of this year. But finally, it's been, a, it's been an immense success story because we have had, um, as we had our digital minister announce at our IGF, at 85,000 new online stores created in the first four months of the pandemic as we moved rapidly over to a digital economy. Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Nick.
So uh, let's move quickly to Mr. Makan uh, Fai from the African Niger. So Makan, please, uh, floor is yours. Three minutes, please uh, try to stick to the time. Uh, good afternoon, everybody from Dakar, Senegal. Uh, we pay tribute to Marilyn Cage, and we thank uh, the IGF secretary for organizing this panel, which is speaking about the digital transformation strategy for Africa of the uh, African Union, which was developed in cooperation with the UN Economic Commission for Africa, the regional economic committees, Smart Africa, to support, to use the internet to support African countries. The overall objective is to harness digital technologies and innovation to transform African societies and economies, to promote Africa's integration, generate inclusive economic growth, stimulate job creation, break the digital divide. The some, of, some of the specific objectives are to build a secure digital single market in Africa by 2030, to digitally empower the African population with safe and secure connectivity using affordable devices, e-services, and content, of which at least 30% is developed and hosted in Africa. We build an inclusive digital skill and human capacity across the digital science, judiciary, and education. To offer massive online e-skills development program to provide basic knowledge and skills in security and privacy in digital environment to 100 million Africans a year by 2020, and 2021 and 300 million per year by 2025. We build a vibrant sector approach to digitalization of the health sector to make sure that by 2030, 99.9% of people in Africa have a digital legal identity as part of civil registration process. The digital transformation strategy for Africa is based on foundation pillar and critical sectors, including the digital health. On cross-cutting themes, also we have digital content and application, research and development. The digital strategy includes policy recommendations and actions on each foundational pillar, critical sector and cross-cutting theme. The strategy is further guided by the principle of solidarity and cooperation. Solidarity between African Union member states, cooperation between the African Union RECs, African institutions and international organizations, and finally linkages to Agenda 263 of the African Union and the Sustainable Development Goals. The digital strategy is being implemented by member states starting by the year 2020. Thank you very much, Makan Fai, Secretary of the African Internet Governance Forum. Thank you very much, Makan, for your uh, nice contribution. So uh, let's move quickly to the, the third speaker in this block, which is Mr. Carlos Vera from the Ecuador IGF. So please, uh, Carlos, uh, three minutes, please. Carlos. Saludos desde Ecuador. Eh, nosotros hemos estado en economía, comercio electrónico. Enfatizo que lo primero que tenemos que hacer es que esta era digital web. My apologies. Uh, the quality of the connection is uh, too low to understand the speaker. Carlos, we are very sorry, but we cannot hear you. Pasar a considerar es en el Ministerio de Transporte. Esto es una cuestión del Ministerio. Yeah. El Ministerio de Comercio. Esto no, todavía vemos que tiene dificultades en ser asimilada por eh, la esfera mundial. Still, we have multiple difficulties to launch it in the global market. What we learned during the pandemic is that it is crucial to have a community-based economy. Unfortunately, we can only hear isolated words from the speaker. Carlos. We can hear you. So we'll have to, to, to... I think he's speaking in Spanish. Somebody... Internet. 
So I'm, I, I am sorry, Carlos, we have to move on. We cannot hear you. We are already well over time. So let's try to move to our uh, last speakers uh, from Eurodic, the European uh, IGF, Ms. Mary Bagdasarian and Mr. Marcel Krumenauer. So you have both uh, together three minutes at most, please uh, try to stick to the time. So yes, please, uh, Mary. Thank you, Flavio. We'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, so this year, Eurodic, the European Dialogue on Internet Governance, also took place as a virtual event in June, uh, just a few months after the pandemic started. And the meeting was launched uh, with a plenary on European digital economy and COVID-19 pandemic. Initially, this session had a different focus, but as the session planning process coincided with the emergence of the pandemic, it was decided to refocus the session to allow for more timely and important discussions at, the, at Eurodic, the Pan-European Internet Governance Initiative. The session was all about the unique state of affairs um, for the European digital economy enforcement um, in uh, in the context of your uh, of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So the multi-stakeholder panel reflected on different aspects of the pandemic's impact on the digital economy, including security, economic, human rights, and innovation dimensions. We had the opportunity to have very lively discussions with uh, speakers from OECD, Council of Europe, Etno, and um, Aria Science Park, uh, an Italian startup accelerator, and thereby setting up the scene for the discussions at the virtual year dig meeting and i had the pleasure to serve as a co-focal point for this plenary and now i'd like to give the floor to my colleague and co-focal point marcel to share with you the uh, brief recap of the key takeaways from our discussions marcel you have the floor so uh, together we focus on numerous acute developments that the pandemic has brought and ask ourselves whether they will persist after the pandemic and are ushering in a fundamental digital paradigm shift Right now, we need to think about the type of sustainable society that we want to create and what role digital technology will play in this society. But we did not only deal with long-term issues, but we also talked about how we can master the current situation with the use of science, solidarity, and mutual support. Therefore, we need to tackle, among other things, the gap of digital divide stakeholders and need a forward-looking approach that promotes investment and co-investment. At the same time, we need to invest in the upskilling on ICT matters in order to facilitate improvements as the internet has been the main channel of communication. The corona pandemic has created a certain dynamic in the economic and academic environment, which makes it necessary to always assess the current situation, both retrospectively and with a forward-looking approach. So to make things short, thanks a lot to all of you for making this come true. And please have a look at the youth dig messages posted by Ricardo in the chat already. Thank you very much, Mary and, and Marcel. So uh, we are uh, arriving at the end of the session. Unfortunately, we do not have time to, to, to discussion anymore uh, as we have to close. Uh, I would ask uh, Enya, please, uh, to share with us the results from the four polls uh, so that people can see. This will be posted also to the list of the NRIs so that people can share with their communities. Can you see them, Flavio? It's flashing, yeah. Oh. Results are, uh, the screen is not stable yet. It flashes, oh, it's fine I don't now. Know, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, in general, in the interest of time, Flavio, let me just say, because yeah. I've seen these polls, I had more time to spend with them than you, is that it seems that our participants indeed see that digital technologies have a huge potential to support people in emergencies. And what's even more good is that on the questions where we ask whether there were any actions or policies already taken to combat emergencies, there were much more positive responses than negative. So it poses a good, I think, foundation for the NRIs to further work on exploring which policies, which actions, what has been done and what needs to be done for the next IGF cycle. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Enya. So, uh, as you know, all uh, main sessions are producing messages. Uh, these are being prepared by the, the, the organizing uh, committee of this uh, main session. This will be available to the community in two weeks from now. And as has been done also in, in uh, most other sessions in this IGF, uh, at the end of the session, the participants, the speakers uh, make their commitments to the IGF and to the future of the IGF. And the commitment we propose for the whole uh, NRI's community at the end of this session 
is that all the participating NRIs, the 131 NRIs, commit to continue facilitating open, inclusive, transparent, bottom-up, and multi-stakeholder dialogue on internet governance matters of people's priority. And this is the commitment we would like that all of our community of IJF, of uh, NRIs, uh, take uh, as their responsibility for the following months and, and years to come. So uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, being present here. And then uh, leave to Anya to conclude the session. Anya, last word. I'm going to conclude with a huge thank you to you, Flavia, to you, Mary. Uh, it's been challenging to focus and organize this session uh, for so many reasons this week, and you've done a remarkable job. From experience, I know it's not easy to moderate this session, especially because, see, that's my alarm for the next session. It's not easy to moderate this session because the NRIs uh, always have a lot to say, and we are always interested to hear about the NRIs and the good practices and press the work that exists there. But I want to thank everyone. I want to thank all the NRIs for uh, tireless work throughout the year, all the speakers, uh, coordinators, co-organizers, all the stakeholders that were supporting the network throughout this year. Uh, as somebody mentioned in the chat, it is true the next session, the high-level leaders session on security, will be in this room. So you do not need to leave the room. That's good. So we can still stay, but we still have to conclude and uh, give time for the transition to another session. With that, uh, thank you very much. Excellent commitments. The forum will definitely benefit from it. And uh, everything that you've heard and you've seen from slides on this uh, session messages will be shortly shared through the NRI's mailing list, will be posted also on the IGF website. Flavio, Mary, thank you so much for, for this. Thank it was you. an excellent thank session. You, Anya. Can we take a picture, please? Anya, can you yes, do, thank uh, you for uh, always picture. reminding me. Everybody turn on your video. All right, let's go, everybody, including myself. So, Anya, can you take the... Anya, you are still there. We need to see everybody. I've, I've just done, I took a photo. Thank you, Mary. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, uh, Flavio, for good, good, good moderation. Thank you, Anya. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye, Thank everybody. Thank you, Flavio Fla uh, and Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Gusto, Flavio, que esté muy bien. Adiós. Adiós, Jennifer. Gusto de verte por acá. Adiós, un gusto. Adiós, Roberto. Muchas gracias. Ok, arrivederci a tutti. Bye. Arrivederci con Chichi. Ok, wonderful moderación.